autumn, a season of mists and mellow fruitfulness. I'm sure you all know that quote. I, I love this. this is, these are bay trees. And <clears throat> you get these beautiful aromatic leaves. Mm, you can dry them and they give flavour to soups and stews all year round. They're fabulous plants. Laurus nobilis, the noble laurel. Coming to its best in the autumn. And here we're in the heart of the forest garden, quite deep shade. Um, slightly dappled light, but <coughs> oh, lost some. <laughs> John Downey, crab apple. One of the few crab apples you can eat straight off the tree and they're sweet. Anyway. Crab apples are great pollinators for other apples. So if you're going to try to grow apples, always have a few crabs around. Mmm, yummy. I always think autumn is the start of the year. Probably because I was born in the autumn. But it's when everything starts to die back. Norami leaves are starting to fall from the trees. Why is this the start of the year? Because life starts with death. As things die back, they create new life for the next season. So people often think of life starting in the spring, but I think actually life starts with decay. Fertility comes from things going back into the soil, creating new life. Hey. This is a fabulous view up this tree here. This is a Juglans regia, European or Persian walnut. Fabulous view of the trunk from the side. <clears throat> the first apple that comes ripe in this garden is this one, Beauty of Bath. Um, picked off in July, August, non left. And they don't keep well, but beautiful apples when they're first picked. Um, but don't keep. So when you're planning a garden you need to have an eye on what's ready when. Things that are ready and need eating straight away and things that keep. These are teasels. Um, we grow them for a couple of reasons. Um, the main one for me being that they're a lovely food plant for goldfinches in the winter. Goldfish is like tall seeding plants and they come in flocks and they're amazingly beautiful birds. So if you leave these stands through the winter they've got something to eat and then you can see them from the house. But traditionally, part of their botanical name is Phalorum, they were used for fulling cloth. So the seed heads were cut and put into frames and they still are in Scotland to process cashmere wool. Um, use it to comb the threads. Very interesting plant. And it has this beautiful um, capacity to hold rainwater in its leaves in these little cups. So in the middle of summer you sometimes find these are full of rainwater and then little insects drown in them. And that again attracts the songbirds. I always find this is a great place to gather. This is getting a bit long now, just needs cutting, but Underneath the hazelnut tree, um, just about pick hazelnuts here. Um, it's always cooler here when the sun is hot. There's places for the kids to play. Um, yeah, a bit of grass in the garden is good. I mean, grass in itself, spending hours mowing lawns, is not a very useful use of gardens. But actually, it does create a good place to kick a ball about, sit down and picnic, chat. The garden for me is a soft living room. It's an extension of the house. In fact, maybe the house is an extension of the garden. You know, this is where we came from. When people talk about going outside, 
they seem to have forgotten us outside is where we come from. Um, so what we're trying to do here, 55 degrees north, if we're in the southern hemisphere we'd be somewhere around South Georgia or Macquarie Island, almost going down to an Antarctica. Um, today, um, just at this, the equinox, autumn equinox, we're warmer than it is in Australia, um, at places like Sydney and Perth, who of course are in their spring. Um, so you can manage microclimate in a way that creates fertility and yields wherever you are on the planet. Uh, and our best help to do all this is trees, this one hazel. But I'm looking across here at uh, some apple trees. Let's go and have a look at here. This apple tree is um, called Blenheim Orange. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. That's probably about three kilos of apples just in my left hand here. This tree's probably got 80 kilos of apples on it. These will keep through till March or April. Um, they're related to Cox's Orange Pippin. Lenin Orange because they were produced in Woodstock just outside Oxford, um, home of the Dukes of Marlborough and Winston Churchill was born there. And they make, not quite ripe yet, a beautiful apple to eat straight off the tree, larger than most children might want to eat, and they make a fantastic baking apple. Take out the core, fill it with sultanas and a little sugar, and bake it. Fabulous. And they'll keep for six months after they're picked. What's the best way to keep an apple then? We'll need to show you the apple store, but the way to keep them is to put them in a cool place where they don't touch each other. And we've got cabinets built especially to do this, which are in our garage. Um, some people used to do it by wrapping them in newspaper and putting them in cardboard boxes. But the main thing is that the air gets round them, they're kept at an even temperature and they don't touch each other. So what use is a, is a pond to a permaculture garden? Why, do we, why are ponds part of the design? <laughs> um, hmm. They have a lot of uses, ponds. Um, you can see there's some duckweed growing on this one. Uh, one of the things you have to remember about water is it's just as important to our survival as a species as is land. So, for example, the continental shelves of the world produce as much oxygen as all the forests of the world. And when we pollute waters that drain into the seas, we are killing our survival. So the more we have standing water, the more we are aerating the planet and creating oxygen that helps us breathe. Because plants breathe in carbon dioxide, which causes global warming, climate change, and they produce oxygen. So that's one of the things. Water as a habitat enables us to produce edible things. Um, we do not have intensive aquaculture systems in this garden. If I was going to start again, I would make a garden that did, because I'm increasingly impressed by what can be done to do that. But to do that, you have to agree to eat fish. Anyway, we have had fish in here in the past, but we have a lot of herons locally. And we've been experimenting with means of keeping herons out. So we will repopulate this with fish in the near future. Ponds are important for ducks. And ducks are a key part of our pest management system here because ducks control slugs. There's a, a common belief that ducks need water to mate on. They don't. They're very happy to mate on land. But they do need water to be able to get their heads on there to clean their eyes. So like me here, yeah, you know, cleaning my eyes. When they do that, they stay healthy. If ducks can't do that, they, uh, they get diseases. But ducks also provide 
breeding ground for frogs and frogs are another fantastic way of keeping the environment in balance and this year because this year we don't have any ducks owing to an unfortunate accident last autumn we've had millions of frogs and their job has been this year to look after our slugs as well but we get mayflies and we get dragonflies very good for invertebrate populations and part of the polycultural system here is dependent on the fact we have songbirds and invertebrates and these are all part of the cycle of life and if they're all looking after each other then we don't get pests we've failed again this year this is an apple called Allington Pippin it... so one of the things we need growing apples is these ones you throw away it doesn't really come ripe until October. Here we are, we're mid to late September. Um, <clears throat> why have we failed? Because look, it's dragging on the ground. It's so weighted down with fruit. So what I'm gonna do here later on today is put a stake in and tie this up. But I'm looking at hundreds of apples off this tree. And this is an experiment. It's a tree that's grown as an espalier which means it sends its arms out sideways with no support. I'm seeing um, 50 or 60 kilos of fruit on this tree. Uh, originally bred in Lincolnshire um, in the mid 19th century. It's a lovely eating apple with a very white flesh. Mm. Mm. Fresh, very fresh. Mm. Clean tasting, but also. Mm. Keeps till Christmas. Great flavour. Easily. But look what you can do by pruning. Here we are in two dimensions with. You know, tens of kilos of fruit in a very small space. This is John Downey, the crab we were looking at earlier. Um, so we're constantly sharing abundance with other people. It's just lovely to be here in the autumn sunshine and see what's going on. Pear trees. So if somebody was to begin the permaculture garden, what advice would you give them to, to start off? Where do they begin? If you want to start a permaculture garden, the best thing that you need to do, first of all, is to understand what you have. The space you have, the land you have, the microclimate where you are, what the seasons do. And that time spent doing some research is more than important, it's vital to whether you succeed or not. Um, and there's a very strict order in which you do things once you, you start to do things. So what you, you don't start doing anything until you know what you've got. When you know what you've got, then start with the things that are most permanent. And the things that are most permanent to start off with are access and water. And these are, can often be combined because waterways can be also pathways. So you can use hard standing access to be something that drains water down a hillside, for example. So the first thing is to decide where you're going to do those things. Um, then when you start to plant, you start to plant with the climax trees, the biggest trees. If there's a view here of big trees, <laughs> then you'll get what I mean. <laughs> um, because if you get it wrong, these are the hardest things to move. And next you talk about understory trees. Um, what 
settles in the forest after that. And then you come down to a shrub layer and then a herbaceous layer and so on down to ground level. But the key thing that's going to make all these things work, uh, apart from the roadways and the water, is building the soil. So what you want to have is a really keen eye on how you're going to build soil. And all of that needs to be done with a mind to what the people who are going to use the plot need. Because at the end of the day, this is all about people. You see, the biggest predator in this garden is us. That's what it's here for. We're the predators. It's designed for us to be able to predate. We can just go out and pick the things we want to eat. Um, but in doing so, we allow all of life to have a place here as well. Maybe we'll get some pumpkins out of here, I don't know. But uh, it can't stop the plant growing. <laughs> it's huge. <laughs> Lots of green manure in the garden. This is the Russian comfy. This time of year, this stuff is all being cut back. So putting things back into the soil constantly. Um, this time of year, the brassicas take over. Um, this is Jersey walking stick, which is kind of kale. It's already as tall as me. It'll make another two or three meters before the end of the year. And that's vitamin C right through the winter months. You see very little bare soil here. As soon as we lift something, we're trying to plant something or keep the ground covered. Keep feeding the soil. <clears throat> These are oka, O-C-A. Um, similar to potatoes, come from the Andes. Um, you don't harvest them until the leaves die back because they swell up at the last moment. Look like clover. Actually related to nasturtiums. a bit of a clear out in the greenhouse in the last week and um, putting in new seedlings for across the winter but we're still getting tomato crops and these guys um, Cape gooseberries uh, Physalis edulis and we've got banana passion fruit up there Passiflora cyrillia um, if you want to grow fruit and vegetables in a northern climate, 55 degrees north as we are, having glass and polytunnels is really, really helpful. Um, so we use this to breed plants that we then plant out. Um, this grapevine up here had 11 kilos of grapes on this year. Uh, it's a variety called Phoenix. Um, it's only three years old. Unheated greenhouse. Same latitude as Moscow and Alaska. This is a very luscious plant. Leicesteria formosa. Himalayan honeysuckle. You see these berries here? Oh, we just dropped one. Now, I'm not so convinced about these because they're beautifully sweet when you bite into them and then they turn hot. What do you think? Wow, that's unusual to say the least. It's, it ends up sort of almost burnt. Yeah. Almost a burnt taste. Mm -hmm. huh? But it's deliciously juicy at the start. Yeah. I don't mind the finish. I think the finish is All quite right. nice. I just wonder if they're probably better in a curry or something. But you see, we're getting loads here. <laughs> I think they're quite Moorish. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Plants for sale. And this is a bed of vegetables which has been taken over by nasturtiums and pumpkins and all kinds of stuff. 
and then we've got some pumpkins going to win here um, and underneath here are carrots and parsley and parsnips and it's just look there's parsnips Woo. <laughs> <laughs> <Those Those names. laughs> yep. So we could clear some of this pumpkin away and get this more space, but we'll get a huge amount of product out of this bed. Mm -hmm. and that pumpkin over there is probably, I don't know, 15, 20 pounds, quite a few kilos. Duke of Devonshire, one of my other favourite apples, slightly rusted, but look at this. <laughs> A very happy tree. What are we going to do with all this food? <laughs> Trees for sale. Leeks, char, low chokes. Oh, it's a little late globe artichoke just coming here. <laughs> Might still get that one. Plum trees, fennel, leeks, summer beans. They're always nicer when they pick young on the beans, nice and tender. You see, Victorians lined the west facing wall with brick. Now why would that be? Because it keeps the heat of the afternoon sun. And this pear, which is called Deacon's, from Deacon's Nursery on the Isle of Wight, and 26 kilos of pears off that tree this year, best ever. But it produces every year, really reliably. Um, I think the Victorians knew what they were doing, you know. Buried in brambles from the blackberries on the wall. And we, we don't mind these guys, you know, look here. Nettles. I have to try to stop people pulling them out because they're food plants for so many butterflies and moths. They make beautiful soup in the spring and they show you the soil is very rich in nitrogen. We spend a lot of time trying to teach people about plants as indicators. This one, tansy. Tanacetum. Often called yellow buttons, come to the end of its season here. But these are growing two metres tall. <coughs> They're a particular ingredient in Easter ledge pudding, very popular in the northwest of England traditionally. It's like a kind of um, bubble and squeak made in a pan. It was often eaten in the early spring because in the days before refrigeration, people ate a lot of salted meat in the winter and that they got prone to worm in the stomach. So these are vermifuges, they drive out the worm. And also they're very rich in uh, vitamins that you need coming out of the winter. So iron and so on um, to rejuvenate the body after the winter months in this northern temperate climate. You can have organic growing systems which are really just sequential monoculture. So whilst we have the benefit of not saturating the land with chemicals, we have the downside of not creating what polyculture does. Uh, we're not a registered organic site. Um, I can't be bothered to spend the time or money jumping through hoops to prove to somebody that we uh, comply with some system that we don't agree with in the first place. You see, we're way beyond that because this is an extremely productive polyculture and that's what makes it productive. The fact that you have this huge variety of plants, insects, songbirds, all cheek by jowl, no bare soil, 
that's what makes this system healthy and productive. Um, so like I say, we don't do pest control. We, if you, The answer is, create the right habitat and the right things will happen. And it's true of plants, it's true of birds, it's true of people. See, the RSPP doesn't try to protect birds anymore. What it tries to do is protect habitat. Perfect approach. Um, because it's the fecundity of uh, a polycultural habitat that makes all this possible. And for minimal work. This garden produces one point, well last year it produced 1.25 metric tons of food from 800 square meters. That's 0 0.08 of a hectare. If you work that out that's more than 16 tons a hectare. My next door neighbor with his John Deere tractors and his 14 furrow plow doesn't get 16 tons a hectare. And this takes two days a week and is done with hand tools. Two tons of earthworms, billions of bacteria, hundreds of fungi, hundreds of different varieties of tree alone. Uh, uh, even more Allington Pippin. Help, what are we going to do? In fear of falling food. These are interesting. These are um, ballerina trees. Uh, <clears throat> a sport of Macintosh found in California, which is genetically dwarf, uh, sorry, not California, Canada, which is genetically dwarf tree, which has been bred on with various different cultivars. And look, this is just what? A little over two meters tall. It's just a pole really and it's covered in fruit yeah what you have to do is stick it in the ground and pick them you don't even need to prune it the right varieties cultivars species understanding the conditions that you're trying to go in and picking the right plants and then yes good soil we're at the end of the rhubarb season here Every book I've ever read about gardening tells you that you have to keep ripping out rhubarb and replanting it. This rhubarb bed is over 50 years old. It's one of the few things that survived from our predecessors in this house. And it self-seeds. And all we do is, um, well, all the dead pets from the family were buried in this garden, so that feeds it a bit. Um, and we just keep harvesting it. It's probably a variety called Victoria from Victorian times and it produces more rhubarb than we could possibly eat every year and it's viable from, let's see, there's still some there we could still eat, um, about March to September. Extraordinary plant. Am I political? Yes, I'm very political. I spent my life being political. What I decided to do quite a long time ago was not be party political because I think uh, having learned from the Simon communities in the United States that if you want to be in community development not being of any particular political flavour means that you don't deter people. But at the end of the day um, we all need to be political and what politics is about is about how we manage the cake. So what goes into making the cake and when we divide it up who gets which share, what percentage do they get and at what cost. Um, and that's all that politics is doing is deciding who gets which share of the cake or the pie or however you want to look at it and why. Um, and who has control of who makes those decisions is another part of it. So we live in a political world. My ambition for the political world is that those decisions are made as local to home as possible. That people in local communities have as much governance as possible over those decisions as they can get. But 
we can't make everything local. If you want a national rail network, it's very difficult to deliver it on the basis of village companies, you know. It, it requires a big business to do it. Um, if we want to import and export things, I mean, I like to eat oranges. You know, it doesn't make sense biologically or energy-wise to grow oranges in Scotland. I've got a few growing in my little front porch, but that's not what I eat when I eat oranges. So, there's still a place for import and export. If you want pepper on your food, as the Fife diet discovered, it's pretty difficult to grow pepper in Fife, you know? Coffee, tea, you know, there are things that, if we want to have them, require us to be part of a global community. But that should be through fair trade. And that's another political decision. That the people who create the food get the benefit from uh, the profit that comes from selling it. Um, all these things can be done more equitably. And that's to me what politics needs to be about. How do we make all this stuff as equitable as possible? Um, famously, Gilbert and Sullivan said um, about inequity, you know, if some at Junket or at Jink should be content with toddy. No, they were talking about socialism at the time in the 1890s, George Bernard Shaw and the Fabians and so on, and they were making fun of it, that somehow we would all be the same. No, we're never all going to be the same. But what we can do is be equitable. If we have more than enough, we can share what we have with other people. And that's what we do here constantly. We share knowledge, we share food, um, we share resources. And we have ourselves been beneficiaries of other people doing the same thing. And we're always grateful for that. The more we can get people to get into a sense of harmony about this, the more we have improved our politics. Um, is politics about creating multi-millionaires at the expense of us? It's not. So unfortunately our politics in the UK are dominated by people who have very expensive tastes and they put out banners about saving the planet in some way or another and then they're making millions. These people are not making good political capital for our country. And to me, it's not difficult to move the world from where we are now to a world in which our politicians get this, that they are on the same level as us. Politics is not about hierarchy. That's about domination. Politics is about fair shares for all, which is what permaculture is about. And that's the kind of political level that we're engaged with here. Um, and somewhere along the way we probably upset some people I don't know but if people don't get that they deserve to be upset the principles of permaculture have been expressed in lots of different ways David Holmgren co-originator of the permaculture concept um, brought it down to 12 basic principles in a simple way which um, of which capture and store energy is the second so there's lots of ways you can capture and store energy. You can grow food. These are runner beans that we were picking as we were walking around the garden earlier. Um, so harvesting food is a simple way of capturing and storing energy. We've got solar panels in the garden which capture and store sunlight and turn it into electricity. We've got firewood stored in the garden. But in Scotland, where we are, in terms of food, this stuff, um, it peaks between July and October so if you want to capture and store it you have to start getting good at preserving food so making chutney cornucopia chutney equinox chutney medlar jelly medlars are a beautiful rosaceae fruit um, if you went to the theatre in Shakespeare's time it would have been what the ice cream girl brought round and you would have had little medlar fruits to eat not ice cream, of course uh, gooseberry jam lots of ways of doing this, I mean I've got some more here um, examples 
saving seeds. Uh, these are seeds of tansy which we give away to people. Other energy you can capture and store is knowledge and experience that you can share with other people. But these are key things to making a sustainable society and the problem with our very mechanistic society based on mass consumption is that we expend energy and we don't hold on to it. So this suggestion is think about how could you change your life so that as much as possible what you needed in a year you could produce for yourself and you could save for later on and if you got a bit more than you need you could share it with other people. I'm Mariana and I'm having a nice cup of coffee in the cottage garden, garden cottage. Um, <laughs> I volunteer for Graham and Nancy doing some of their more mundane admin tasks but it has to be done you know we need to collect information um, just, you know um, basically what brought me here was an interest in permaculture and I live not far up the road um, I moved to the countryside about eight months ago and um, basically as a complete novice with regards to gardening and living from the land um, always something I've been interested in but being a city dweller it's not something that's easily accessible so finally the opportunity arose for me to move to a really nice part of the world, um, Abbey St Bathens, which is in the borders. Um, and my landlady is, you know, Mrs Greenfingers and she's amazing. So she's been teaching me a lot about how to look after the land there and certain plants and just, you know, growing potatoes, carrots um, to start off with. So that was this year. Um, so it's been interesting coming to a garden such as this one which has been established for 25 years and looking, you can kind of see where you can get to if you persevere. Um, and also even just in one season, I've seen how quickly things grow and how they want to grow and it's been really inspiring. Um, yeah, it just makes more sense to live simply, to live off the land, to use the natural resources. Um, it's easy for me to say that, but I'm so conditioned into being a consumer, having been brought up in a city and living there for so long. It's actually a massive transformation and it's a difficult one. Um, but it's worth doing and the more you go down that path the more you realise you know, it makes more sense. That's